Working Cows Podcast, Episode 27. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Are you sinking in a swamp of sample rates and editing? Do you feel trapped in a prison of file formats and kilobits per second? It's time to drain that swamp. It's time to lock down those file formats. It's time to make your audio great again. And Chris Williams is the guy to do it. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your podcasting, music production, and film audio needs. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery here, host of the Working Cows podcast. Today, we have Bob Howard on the show. He is part of Desert Mountain Grass-Fed Beef in Idaho. And from the website, we have this note. We live in a dry part of the world and believe that producing beef in a sustainable way is what God intended us to do. We learned the hard way that our base cow herd has to fit our environment, so we developed a line-bred herd of Angus cows with the help of Larry Linhart from Shoshone Angus. It has taken 20 years to remove the cross-breeding mess that we started from, but today we have a set of cows that can renew themselves in this environment. And we are going to get into that in a lot more detail with Bob Howard, who is our guest today. On the Working Cows Podcast. Bob, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows Podcast. I'd like to give you an opportunity just to share a little bit about your operation as you introduce yourself. So we live in Idaho. In in the wintertime, we winter in the desert. In the summer, we run in the high mountains of Idaho. And we actually also have a grass-fed beef business. And over my lifetime, what I found about cows is cows need to be raised in an environment in which they're going to stay in or real similar. And the more I learned about cows, the more I learned that they're just like plants. And to breed plants, they have true parent lines to breed plants. And what we found is we've really lessened the um, odds or the percentages of cattle that will drop out of our cow herd by raising our own bulls, starting with the line of cattle that we started with. Sure. And so about 22 years ago, we started on this inbred, linebred parent stock deal. And we never did buy any females. We just bought bulls for about the first 15 years or, or so. And they were Shoshone Angus bulls out of, and they were highly related to one male and one female that Larry Linhart had identified their Shoshone Angus ranch in the late 80s. And they were from Y, and I can't tell you enough about bloodlines to even know. But what I did identify is that he had a lot of cows that I liked with that kind of lineage. And what Larry told me is if you buy bulls here, don't think that when you get done that your cows will look different than mine. They'll look just like mine. And today we have 350 head of them cows that look just like those cows that we started to try and get. And they're moderate frame cows that have good others, udders, and they love their calves. And in the cattle business, it's hugely important to have a cow that loves her calf. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so we have that line of cows and we've done some different things later. And that's what Larry had also taught us about hybridization is good for offspring. So we bred some of them to Charlotte bulls to have true F1 hybrids and we'd sell them into the commodity market or feed them ourselves. And they fed great and they were big and good. And, but what we really after all the time was them good black females. Sure. So about the last 10 years or eight years, We've taken and left the testicles in our black calves, or a percentage of them probably, I would say 40%, and we have our own bull sale. And at the same time, then we start putting our own bulls back on our own cows. And we just, it's become really, really, really simple what we do. And we haven't lost any weaning weight. We haven't lost anything. What we've gained is cows that'll reproduce in our environment really readily, and they don't fall out of the herd. How long have you been doing following these these practices? For twenty two years. 
<laughs> 23 or four years. Well, we weren't really into it the first six years or so. We just keep heifers and stuff and trying to, and we started with a hybrid crossbred cow herd because we believed a lot of stuff that we'd read and it wasn't true. And then we thought we could buy expensive bulls and fix that. And all we were really doing is increasing our hybridization and getting our predictability way down. And so for, I would say for 18 or 19 years, we haven't um, bought any bulls anywhere else. And we've only kept our own heifers in that cow herd. Sure. And you mentioned three things that you think makes up a good cow. And, and could you review those things for me? Sure. The most important thing on a cow is she has to have a coupon or a calf. <laughs> and that's hugely important. And she has to be able to do that in her environment without any input additives if she's going to be a low-cost producer. And so then she has to have the live calf. She has to nurse him herself. And she has to have stability. And we went her out on the desert. We, that same set of cows have never had any hay in their life. And we've have fed the heifers the last two or maybe three years for 45 days just before they calve because of the way we winter our cows. But those cattle, they actually don't even get any added minerals. Hmm. Because we had been over to Larry's and talked about things. And he said, why does 85% of the cows breed without the mineral? I just go, I don't know. That's a really good question. The other thing that made me laugh about Larry, <laughs> he used to feed a lot of mineral and he goes, you know, every time that mineral salesman come in here, he left with two of my black bulls on the back of that little pickup. <laughs> he said, I thought maybe I'd just have him leave without two of them bulls and we could see what we did. And what we found is that our cattle work within our environment and our breeding percentages last year were the very best they've ever been. The cows were 98% bred back. Hmm. And that's with 50 or 60 head of two-year-old heifers mixed right in them. We don't segregate anything. We don't do anything. We do take the heifer calves the first winter and just because we don't have enough country to winter them on and winter them around on farm fields, but we have them turned out on grass now. And so we're a grass outfit. And that's what we truly believe if we're going to be sustainable, that we had to be, and especially in our climate in Idaho, what we were doing before that is we spent a lot of money on uh, diesel and machinery. And then every time you get ahead, the machinery would be wore out and you have to buy more machinery or more diesel. And it just didn't seem like it was very much fun at all. <laughs> so not at all. Can you tell me a little bit about your environment? What what part of Idaho are you in? And and we're in a six inch rainfall area where I live in the winter, and it's a desert, and it, it lays in a rain shadow. It's about fifty five or sixty miles south of Boise, Idaho. And the only thing that saves our life is we have a hard pan in that desert, and so every ounce of moisture that we get in the winter won't go underneath that hard pan, and the hard pan is not only about you know, in places six inches deep and then other places a foot deep. So we get to save that five inches of rain or whatever, and we can grow feed. And spring comes to our place the 14th of February, but summer comes the 1st of May. Our grass turns yellow in May every year. Hmm. But we're also in Idaho that has huge elevation changes. So we summer some of those cows, those black cows that actually end up summering at 7,500 feet. We have to haul them about 150 miles one way to get to there. But our deal is farm ground in between, so it's not that big a deal. And I don't know. It's just the way we ended up being. And so then in the fall, in November, we wean the calves. And we haul them cows back to the desert and turn them out. And in the summer, well, in the fall, our calves will weigh 575, the steers and the heifers will weigh five and a quarter. And we calve right now. You're calving and, in March and, and April? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And actually, them dang black cows, they all calve lots of them in the first heat cycle. The other right. reason why we calve when we do is because that's when we have the very strongest grass to bull them cows on. Sure. And is that similar and it's not to hot. is that similar to the strategy of feeding your your second calf heifers, was it? Uh, just for forty five days you're trying to get them into condition for breeding? Well, and and we tried not doing that and we've had mixed results. But if we feed them heifers, if we start feeding them the fifteenth of January we found that we can really up the conception rate in them and it helps the heifers be stronger to calve too. And there was just a lot of good about that. So we feed them from about the 15th of January. This year we didn't have to start feeding until the 1st of February. And as soon as they calve, then we kick them back on the desert. We have a deal right there. We can just kick them back out and they just get right on with it. And it seems to work pretty good. Sure. Can you tell me about some of your, what's your winter like there? I mean, you said six inches of rainfall. Is there there's some snow cover there that you're dealing with? Last winter, there was snow cover every two or three weeks. It would snow eight or nine inches. 
And it's really fascinating because we have some other cows around that we own and we take care of some other cows. And when it gets tough, those other cows are always thinking somebody's going to come and help them. But those black cows, nobody know nobody's coming, so they never look. <laughs> <laughs> but last winter was the first year in 30 years that I thought we were going to have to feed because of weather, but it broke there in February and we was fine. One of my favorite moments on the podcast so far was an episode I did with Melinda Sims there in McFadden, Wyoming, kind of high area or high elevation. And they, they do a lot of windrow grazing. And she said that when we stopped feeding with a tractor, we found out our cows did better on it because they're not running after the tractor all the time, you know, trying to, trying to chase the tractor down to get some food. They know that the, the windrows are out there. Yep. Yep. And they yep. just go get it. And so that's an interesting fact because that's how we feed our heifers. We set out lots of bales. And by setting those bales out, those heifers never get hooked onto a picket. We'll feed for four or five days or whatever. And we waste a little bit of hay, but those heifers are never upset. And they just know that that's gonna, they're going to be all right. And I'm that way. I like to eat, and I like to eat on time. <laughs> I understand. Yep. Yeah. I'm the same way. Yep. So you mentioned you, you referred to the calf as a, as a coupon. She's got to have that coupon. And that's kind of her, her uh, ticket to stay or ticket to ride on, uh, for another year at the place. Is that? If they don't have a calf on our outfit, we sell them. That's just the way it is, either at weaning or after calving. And we just made that decision 22 years ago just to do that. And what we found now is we have a line of cattle that are prolific. They calve every year and they want to be cows. And it's just been a fascinating ride to watch that progress and, and then get to the point it is now. And them cows, it's just fascinating to watch that set of cows. They don't get any care. Nobody goes and looks. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, they are, they winter over there. They have their own allotment on a BLM deal and they haul, we haul water there and we just sell the dries in the fall, in the spring and the fall. And they don't take any care. You said that you've been doing this for 22 years and you, and you mentioned uh, Larry, is that, it, was right. he an influence on you? Huge. This? Okay. Huge. Beyond belief. And is, what was, who's Larry? Sorry. Can you clear that up? Larry Linhart. Okay. That show show in Angus Ranch. Yep. I've heard the name. He understood what cattle genetics were more than anybody I've ever been around. And he understood about inputs and if you aren't going to get something for nothing. The only way you get something from nothing is a hybrid. And you can only get that on one cross. And he's so right. Today, the great Angus cows, wow, they're wonderful. They're exactly what the Charlay cows were 30 years ago. They weigh between 14 and 1,800 pounds, and they'll have a 700-pound calf. And the Charlay cattle would do that 30 years ago. Right. So I don't have any idea what they accomplished. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. <laughs> and so what, what specific cross are you guys using? Well, on those black cows, so we go a little, quite a ways further than where we're at here. On those black cows, we use black and Charlay bulls to uh, get a hybrid. We want the F1 Charlay Angus cross heifers out of those inbred, linebred cows. And we use Akaushi bulls on those for our grass-fed program. Okay. And so it's just, uh, yeah, and they're really consistent. And the, and the reason we like the Charlay cross more than the Angus is we get about 50 to 75 pounds more carcass weight out of them grass-fed cattle and maybe 100 pounds on the steers more carcass weight on them grass-fed cattle. And when you're selling cattle by the hot hanging weight, that's hugely important. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, what percentage of your herd are you selling as, as grass-finished, or are you selling you any? Know, we keep all of the heifer calves out of the black cows. We sell the gray steer calves and a few of the black bull calves, or steers. And then we have another complete set of cows that we run through the grass-fed beef business, and we sell about five or 600 a year out of that deal. And going forward, we'll sell more. We've built a grass-fed beef business that's pretty fascinating. We're in 17 or 18 stores, and we have to go from here to Park City, Utah, from Boise, Idaho, and then to Seattle. Hmm. Because we have to be in where a more concerned shopper is. It doesn't make them a better shopper. It just makes them more concerned to support what we do and support our grass-fed beef business. Sure. Well, we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsors, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more with Bob Howard about his operation there in Idaho. The High Plains Ranch Practicum is an invaluable resource. I cannot stress 
highly enough how much I think it is important for producers to be involved in continuing education programs. So go check out the High Plains Ranch Practicum at hpranchpracticum.com and register. The class that I was a part of sold out before the deadline. And so the deadline is the end of May. But go ahead and register early and make plans to be a part of this. Just a great format for continuing education for ranchers. hpranchpracticum.com, our newest sponsor on the Working Cows podcast. Okay, we're back with Bob Howard. We've been talking a little bit about some of the changes that they've made over the last 22 years. Uh, I'd like to talk with you a little bit more about the genetics piece of it. Uh, What are some of the things that you guys are doing to pay attention to genetics? Is it strictly just weaning and and getting a live calf on the ground and then weaning that calf? Or what are some of the other things that you guys are doing? Or is there anything else? That is what we're doing and pregging the cows. That is what we're doing. And they're doing what they do and they do it really consistently. And it's just fascinating how simple it's become. When I tell people this, they don't, we don't think of our cow herd as a super cow, this number, number, this, blah, blah, blah. We think of our cow herd as a population of cattle and everything is on averages within that population of cattle. And those genes that are in those cattle are what they are, but they are, they breed true to what they do. And then it's hard to explain how that really is to most folks, but it, we sell our calves or we feed them ourselves and they feed our Charlay cattle will out feed anybody's in the country and our black cattle feed with everybody else's. We fed them black steer calves several different times in uh, natural programs. They'll be 92% choice. They may feed for five cents a pound more cost at the feed yard or something than our Charlay cross calves. Or we sell bulls to our neighbors and their calves feed like a house on fire and we don't worry anything about growth in our cattle. We don't worry about phenotype now in the cows very much. We allow our environment to show us the form that will function within our environment. And form will follow function if you allow it to over time. And that was one of the hardest things for me to really realize that the human eye can't tell what's underneath that skin. Only the genes that you put in can tell what's going to happen underneath that skin. And that's just been a fascinating learning curve for me. Hmm. What, was, what was your background? What, how did you... Born and raised on a ranch. Okay. And I've been you, you're... in the cow business for 50, 45 years. And you're talking about a, a learning curve. What was the background of that ranch that you came from? You know, actually, we were a cow-calf ranch in the mountains of Idaho. And we, we had a luxury that nobody had, and we all did when we were young. I'm 60 now. Because if you went to somebody's place and bought a bull, your cattle pretty soon would start looking like his cattle because nobody had mass transportation or AI needles. Hmm. And so you were buying a genetic from a genetic pool when you went to buy a bull. And it's just been fascinating how we've gotten away from that. And now we're going to do this with numbers and do that with numbers. And what we end up with is just a coagulated gene pool of randomization is what it is. Hmm. It's just randomization. There's 110,000 on the mother's side, 110,000 on the father's side. And the less you randomize them, the more predictability you'll have. Yeah. So I don't, do you know the Permans here in South Dakota? Uh, Luke and Lyle Perman? Well, I know Luke. I, yeah, I've met him, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He was the one who recommended that I get you on the show. And, that, and that's what he said was uh, predictable genetics is one of the things that you have been going after. And you mentioned right. earlier that form. Well, go ahead. I'll tell you, let's go back a ways. When we started at Larry Linhart's, we were calling 25% of our cows a year, either for age or open or something. And today, last fall, I think we had eight opens out of them 340 head of cows. And they're a pretty young set of cows. We maybe take four or five older cows out of them. Some of them cows are 16 or 17 years old now. And they're still functioning. We don't mouth them. We don't tag them. We don't do anything with them. That's remarkable given your... Uh, Our environment. We right. don't take care of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I know. And it's just fascinating to me, all the baloney that's been fed to everybody. But nobody will go study what plant scientists do to grow plants. There's not one field of corn in the United States that isn't a true hybrid out of two true line parents. Hmm. I want to finish up camping out on on those two ideas that you've kind of mentioned after the break here. First of all, that form follows function. uh, That basically, if I'm understanding you correctly, if she's going to get bred, she's going to have the form that 
is what you're looking for anyways. And so if you just keep over picking. Time. Yeah. Over time, that form will show up and it won't be what you really think you really thought you needed. And it won't be if you start with the right kind of genetics, it'll be really pleasing to your eye. And it's just fascinating how they just have come to be that. Do they differ in size? Do they differ in uh, utter <laughs> just composition? Just because of age. <laughs> <laughs> just because of age and the older cows are a little bit bigger than our young cows. And the utter composition is 90 or 86 or 87% identical. Hmm. I mean, they just have nice udders. We breed every heifer. We turn the bulls with every heifer. We don't calve in a real tight window, probably a 60, 70 day window. But we just breed those heifers for a heat cycle and a half because we want to be done calving. And we get about 80% of them heifers bred. Hmm. And we didn't do any sorting. We don't go in there and take the peewees off or any of this or that. And it's just fascinating how it just goes along. You just let them prove themselves that I can get bred, so I deserve to be here. Right. Well, or and we need some cash flow anyway, so the open ones are actually a blessing. Right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. We talked to Trey Patterson on episode 11 of the Working Cows podcast, and he said, if you if you control your input costs on developing a heifer, she's still a marketable female and profitable. Right. So. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, and, th- and this form follows function and all them things are just fascinating. Yeah. And the other thing that you mentioned was, is treating your cow herd more like a a plant scientist would. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that? So an inbred parent line is bred back to itself for three generations on both sides, both the male and the female, so that it's really predictable. And it'll be 85% predictable, the inbred parent line. And you can talk to any plant scientist around. And But a plant scientist can do that in one year in a greenhouse. (laughs) And in a cow herd, it takes 10 years to do that. And so that's the problem that most people have. And then to make a hybrid, you just take those two inbred parent lines and cross them. And that's what all the field corn and that's what all the seeds of the world are made out of that are consumed by humans is those out of those inbred parent lines. But if you see the inbred parent's corn, you'll just laugh at the salesman. So he doesn't show you what the inbred parents should look like. <laughs> he shows you what the hybrid ear corn looks like. Yeah. And, but, but. There's only one way they can get that predictability. If you plant that ear of corn back, if you took that seed and planted it back, you'd have 25% that were too small, 50% that were just right, and 25% that were too big that maybe you wouldn't even have any corn on them. Hmm. And that's just the randomization of genes. (laughs) And the more you randomize them, the more wild it becomes. Is there a point at which the inbred parent lines become uh, a detriment? (laughs) So that was a thought that I had for a long time. So I watched PBS this winter. In wild populations, if a population gets below 1,000, it can become extinct. If the population will stay above 1,000, it doesn't become extinct because of the randomization within those deals, within that big of a group of gene pools. And so what that means is 500 females and 500 males. But we probably don't have to have the 500 males as long as we have the 500 females. And as long as we keep plenty of bulls and let nature breed what it breeds. And so we've been running them cows at one to uh, about 18 bulls, 18 cows to a bull, but we're probably going to go to 15 cows to a bull and let the fittest survive. And I think that it was, that was the most fascinating thing I ever seen was that winter on PBS this winter Hmm. about how to stop that from being too inbred. And I wasn't sure in my lifetime it ever would become that because like Larry Lenhart said, if you see something that's too little or too inbred, you just sell it. And we have never had hardly anything show up like that, but you could see maybe you could. But with by using multiple sires on big groups of cows, I think you just take piles of that away. And we aren't telling any cow that she's better than the other one, and we're not telling any bull that he's better than anybody else. Everybody's the same. And then I'll even be more eccentric. Larry talked about pheromones and the smell of brothers and sisters if there's an opportunity to not breed or to breed. And why would wild animals not become inbred too much? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we have huge herds of elk and deer in Idaho, and they don't get any outside genetic deals, but you don't see little inbred deals, and they, they'll die is probably what they do, but we don't lose populations. Our populations continue to grow as long as the feed source is good. Sure. Hmm. Fascinating stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, it's real really, eccentric, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, no, it's you know <laughs> the the tagline of the Working Gals podcast is providing producers a platform to discuss paradigm challenging practices. So uh, I think we've done that here today. <laughs> okay, well, call. I'm not done. <laughs> we just got off, got it started. Yes, sir. So no. did you know that when we feed our F1 heifers out of and the Akushi calves on them that at 150 days. They're at 38% prime. Yeah. <laughs> and so they chase this marbling deal and we can fix the marbling deal in one cross. Hmm. <laughs> and no yield grade fours at 150 days are 1% or 2%. Wow. And that's feeding 900 or 1,000 pound yearlings for 150 days. Hmm. And their diet yeah. is, on, on, in that situation, what's their diet? In that situation, they were fed corn in Texas. Okay. Yep. Our grass-fed cattle are pretty choicey at about 22 months on grass on that same deal. Yeah. Controlling the hybrids is huge if you want to have success in being predictable. How did somebody get started if they wanted to, to look at doing something like this? You know, I don't even know. What I would do is I would buy a set of heifers from somebody that was doing it. Probably is the easiest way or just go buy some bulls and stop crossing them. But you're going to have to start with genetics that are pretty proven. That was the blessing we had. Larry Lenhart went through all the inbred parent line deal before I ever got there. He already had the inbred parent line force to use. And so this deal is all because of Larry Lenhart and Shoshone Angus Ranch. And it isn't that some other people don't do that, but I know why our success has been what it's been. Because of the genes we started with, and then we, didn't, we haven't introduced any new gene pools into that deal. Hmm. And so I don't, I'm not positive how, if I was young, how I would do it. Sure. Um, I wouldn't be afraid. They're just cattle. You can always sell cattle. Right, right. <laughs> but I wouldn't just try it with any genetics. You can, but it's going to be 25 or 30 years before you get where you want to go. That's how long it took Larry to get his. Well, Larry was a scientist and he was a farmer and he understood this plant breeding. And he actually studied the why the cattle came from why that he used. And he understood a lot of things. And then when he started his in bed parent line deal, he used, he did the three generations to see what he had. He said one of the things that slowed him down the most is that he didn't use multiple sires after he got going hmm. because he thought he could control this and that, but the multiple sires clean up a lot of the problems. Hmm. Interesting. And then you don't, you don't have too many problems in a big percentage because if one bull bred 20 head of cows or even the most dominant bull bred 30 head, you'd only have 15 heifers and 15 males, you know? Right. Or if you're AI or something, you could have 200 of each. <laughs> and if it's wrong, you're in a lot of trouble. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing that he said that was so interesting is in nature, the toughest, most aggressive male only lasts two or three or four years at the most. Hmm. So how much trouble can he cause over how much time? 45 head of heifers if he was really aggressive for three years and 500 cows. Right. You know, it just, it lowers the percentages. Yeah. Very much. Any any resources or any any research uh, things that I could throw in the the show notes page for this episode? Oh, research! Yeah, read what Larry wrote. <laughs> I it's all captured on Mike Keeney was smart enough to get him to capture it on uh, Keeney's corner on the internet. Okay. About three years before he passed away, he started having Larry talk about this eccentric stuff. Hmm. And it's all captured there on about 100 pages or 120 pages hmm. of what he learned. Well, I definitely will we'll track that down and, and make a link to that. Uh, any, any way that people can keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, they can follow us on Desert Mountain Grass-Fed Beef. It's our website. Okay. DesertMountainGrassFedBeef.com, correct? Yep, I think so. I think I think that's what I saw earlier today, but I'll I'll make yeah. sure it's right in the show notes page. Um, yeah, the show notes page for this episode will be workingcows.net slash twenty seven. So if you want to go and and check out any of those resources that we've mentioned, uh, go to workingcows.net slash twenty seven. Hope that was some help with what you're trying to do. Yeah, no, it's exactly what we're trying to do. So I I'm not sure I've got my mind wrapped around it fully yet, but I will. Continue Good to... luck. You sound awful young. You got about 30, 40 more years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm so, let me tell you what I really think the most important thing to what you asked that is allow the paradigms in your mind to shift. Yeah. That's the most important thing in breeding cattle. Yeah. Yeah. I went through the High Plains Ranch practicum in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's put on by uh, Aaron Berger and Dallas Mount. And 
they're extension agents, but Dallas is also an ext- instructor with Ranching for Profit. And so they, they kind of push the paradigm challenging. And that's the whole first week of that class is challenging your paradigm. And that's kind of what started me on this journey. So, well, outstanding. Yeah. Why do you do what you're doing? <laughs> you need yeah. to ask that question. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. All right. You have a great day. Yes. Thanks for your time. You bet. I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Kamak Ranch Supply on being selected as the 2018 recipient of the Leopold Award. This award celebrates producers who are great stewards of the land and the cattle and the water resources and all of those things that have been entrusted to them. And this just goes to show the kind of producers they are at Kamak Ranch Supply. And I congratulate Gary and Amy on this award. If you have any needs, head on over to their website, kamakranchsupply.com. Well, it was just a great opportunity to sit down with Bob Howard and to think a little bit differently about the genetics. I want to give a tip of the hat to uh, Luke Perman, who sent that to me as another one of the recommended guests that he sent my way. And I'm excited to be working through that list uh, little by little. So I believe Bob was actually the first person off that list that I have contacted and been able to sit down and record an episode with. So a lot more great guest recos coming from Luke in the future. Uh, including his dad, who we've we've been in contact with, just haven't gotten that episode recorded yet. So uh, next week on the show, we have John Kempf of Advancing Eco Ag, which is a very interesting uh, group and all the different things that they are doing there uh, with more agricultural landscapes, but just a great opportunity to also talk about where cows fit into some of those agricultural landscapes and and how maybe some of those things are uh, getting missed. So make sure you don't miss any episodes of the Working Cows podcast. Subscribe to the show. Uh, The easiest way to do that is go to workingcows.net. Workingcows.net, almost every page on workingcows.net has in at least one place, some of them in two places, a little subscribe to the Working Cows podcast uh, set of links, and you can subscribe there via RSS feed or more simply via Android or uh, subscribe on Apple Podcasts. So go subscribe to the show at workingcows.net, and we will see you next week with John Kemp for episode 28 of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.